Actress Julie Christie. Hello, this is Julie Christie. Um, talking a little bit about uh, this film, this wonderful film, I think, that I was in a long time ago. I find it very impressive, um, right from the very beginning, that uh, the first opening, which is kind of documentary style, I think, um, the voiceover, I think that voiceover was a copy of uh, sort of 50s newsreels, the very sort of uh, formal, um, almost aggressive um, a, 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 um, pronouncement of, of events and things. In fact, it's got just our names. But I think it's setting a kind of, um, from the very beginning, you're almost in some kind of media control. So both the voice and the aerials were taken into a world immediately of control and state broadcasting. Editor Tom Noble. There's no text in anything. It was seems to be integral to the idea of nobody being able to read. So when you know Montag is reading those comic books, there's absolutely no text to them. So I think that it was okay to have text at the end because everybody was reading, but at the front you didn't want text at all, you just wanted the, the voice. And then it was a question of finding those TV images, which we then basically put filters over. I mean, they were all shot sort of straight, and I think then Francois decided he wanted pink on this one, and red on this one, and whatever. And they all had to be, you know, for those individual people. Jeremy Spencer when he's on the phone. That was really done with zooms, actually. So it was all, and then but you cut the zoom out. So it was like it was like a zoom, and then you cut, and then a zoom, and then you cut the zoom out, and so it was. Then it became just one after the other. So uh, I'd never, you know, I'd never never cut anything before. So this was like a revelation to me. <laughs> that was always true for his concept for that scene. So that wasn't me at all. Producer Lewis M. Allen. At that point in my life, uh, Truffaut was, was just the, the most wonderful director. I mean, he'd done the 400 blows, shoot the piano player, and uh, of course, Jules and Jim, which I just adored. I thought it was a marvelous film, and I couldn't be more thrilled. I mean, I would have done anything he asked me to do if I could get it together. Uh, but it so happened that Fahrenheit I was already interested in. We drew up all the contracts, I, I can't believe this now, uh, with his French lawyer, and I didn't even have a lawyer, but we did it all in French at the offices. It so happened that his French lawyer was a, happened to be a friend of mine too, but so it was all very friendly. But to think of going in there and drawing up an entire film contract with a director without a lawyer at your side was kind of amazing. Actress Julie Christie. We understand the books are the enemy right at the very beginning of the film. The communication is the enemy, seen as the threat to society. Editor Tom Noble. Well, all that opening scene, I mean, you know, I'd never cut a montage or anything before, so it was like a revelation to me, you know, putting the pieces together. But what I realized, you had to cross cut like crazy. If you cross cut like crazy, those guys were really doing a great job. You know, you like, they you see them start to undo the TV screen, you go to something else, then they'd be back taking it off, and then you do something, and I thought, God, this is really good, this is montage. I've never, like, wow, I can do this. <laughs> so it was really extraordinary. But he, they were beautifully shot, those, you know, they were. They were very succinct pieces of film, and you just sort of placed them exactly where you felt they should go, and you know, they had their own rhythm to them somehow. And once you'd put them in the right order, that was it, you know, there there's no way else you could go, that was it. Columbia University professor and author of a critical study on Francois Truffaut, Annette Insdorf. Maybe a footnote about what science fiction might have meant to Truffaut. Um, he once said, I think, that for him, the umbrellas of Cherbourg were science fiction. Well, because it's an otherwise natural story in which there's one difference. The characters are singing instead of speaking. Now, in that sense, perhaps Fahrenheit 451 is science fiction. Editor Tom Noble. So there's one uh, thing when we're watching dailies, and uh, of the uh, right at the beginning of the of the montage of the uh, of the burning of the books, and Francois said to me, and I think he's very awkward, Oscar basically dressing, 
So I was thinking to myself, well, how do we do anything about that? We've got the best take in. And then I suddenly realized that actually what we could do is reverse the film of him actually undressing and make him dress. So in other words, when he took off the thing, he put it on in one smooth movement. When he actually had the gloves taken off him, they suddenly went on him like this and handing off the flamethrower. So it was actually worked perfectly backwards. And so I showed it to Francois and I said, you know, how about this? And he was absolutely thrilled about it. But I said, no, it's even better than that, Francois, because it's a quote, and I know you love to quote from Hitchcock, but this is a quote from Jean Cocteau because it's the, the rubber gloves that Orphée puts on in exactly that reverse way. And he was absolutely thrilled, and so was I. It was just a, a magical moment, right, very early on in our relationship. So it was, it was great. Actress Julie Christie. This outfit, this ridiculous outfit him, Oscar is wearing, his Montag is wearing, is all to do, isn't it, with uh, the fact that books can contaminate. He doesn't need to wear that outfit. I suppose it's safety because it's asbestos, but the way it looks is very much like a, uh, a nuclear, um, the sort of stuff, the protective clothing you wear in nuclear plants. Yeah. Editor Tom Noble. Ellen Scott was really, um, Francois, sort of, I guess, right, well, basically his translator of the script, I think, into, uh, into English from the, his version with Jean-Louis Richard. Um, and basically his conduit to everybody that was English speaking on the film. Columbia University professor Annette Insdorf. The wonderful Helen Scott. She was his friend, his translator, and his collaborator in the process of interviewing the uh, great Hitchcock and then of transcribing the interviews into book length form. She was very often the mediator in many senses, and she played a very important role in his personal life as his friend, in addition to his professional life, subtitling his films and, of course, the Hitchcock book. Editor Tom Noble. I was intrigued by it, the girl that sort of kisses the glass and the boy that's sort of rubbing himself. There was something about that that I thought, well, this is the society he's trying to show. Everybody's sort of narcissistic. Actress Julie Christie. It might seem like a narcissistic society because people are sort of kissing themselves in windows and putting their arms around each other, but I think in a way it's what it is, is a starved society. Producer Lewis M. Allen. I thought that narcissism uh, was kind of interesting, but it was also a little puzzling. I mean, I don't, I think you had to think it through to see why, he, why they were doing this. It wasn't an immediate, uh, oh yes, that's, uh, I see why they're doing that because you had to trace it back to the fact that they had no, they did not read, and therefore they had no kind of, uh, of a life outside themselves. They turned in on themselves. It's, but you have to rationalize that as far as I'm concerned, but still it's effective whether you understand it or not. Columbia University professor Annette Insdorf. I know that the experience of making Fahrenheit was not the happiest one for Truffaut. He was indeed outside of his usual element, linguistically, geographically. Um, he couldn't have the same family around him that he had for his French films. Um, in terms of Truffaut's filmography, Fahrenheit 451 occupies a rather bizarre spot. His first three films were, to varying degrees, successful. In other words, 400 Blows, very successful, critically and commercially. Shoot the Piano Player, actually a flop when it first opened, subsequently revived by people like myself. Jules and Jim, though, was very successful, critically and commercially. Then he makes The Soft Skin, the first of what I would call his Hitchcockian films in the 1960s, coinciding with the period during which he was interviewing Alfred Hitchcock on tape with Helen Scott and then publishing the book. Well, The Soft Skin was a real flop. And indeed, when I first saw that film, too, I was very disappointed because I wanted that engaging lyricism of compelling characters and camera work as in Jules and Jim, and instead I found this really dark story of contemporary adultery. It's on the heels of that that he makes his first English language film, Fahrenheit 451. And so it comes at a time in his career when he really could have used a success, and this wasn't to be that at all. It was followed by other films that didn't exactly do wonderfully, like The Bride Wore Black or Mississippi Mermaid, and I think he suffered a great deal as a result. Editor Tom Noble. 
They only had a very small amount of monorail. Somewhere outside Paris, I think that was. So I think they just went over there for two days with Oscar and Julie and just shot their scenes, and that was it. Then everything else was obviously the blue screen when they were traveling in it. So it was just for those moments. They just, uh, I mean, I think it was only two days. They just suddenly vanished and then they <laughs> did that scene. Towards the end of the picture, I mean, I've, we got into that stage where I think we're kind of fine cut on the picture. And then Francois drops this bombshell on me. He says, oh, I've got this friend coming over from Paris, and Jean Grel, who's worked with me on adaptations and things before, and uh, he has this knack of being able to just turn the picture upside down. He'll put real three where real two is, he'll put real seven where real nine is, and, and I thought, Oh, right. I, I find this hard to believe as well because, you know, it, it, it has, you know, very logical structure, you know. Anyway, so the guy comes, and I realize that he doesn't speak English either. So there's the two of them. They're chatting away. I'm listening to what they're saying, and I think, well, this is going to be very difficult for him because, obviously, it's an English-language film, and he's supposed to be reconstructing it. So we run the film, get to the end of it, and they chat away and they chat away and I'm listening to him saying, you know, you should put this scene here. And I think, God, you know, this is amazing. He really is doing this. So Francois says, okay, I think we've got it. Now, this is what we're going to do. We're going to put this scene here, this and that and the other thing. How long is that going to take you to do? And I said, well, it's very simple. I mean, let me go back to the cutting room. It'll take me 20 minutes, that's all. I mean, it's very simple. You just take that scene up, put it there, take that scene and put it there. In the version that we showed Jean, he met Linda, and then he met Clarice. And he turned that around, so he met Clarice before he met Linda. So that was the big change in it. You know, I can't remember exactly how that affected the story as it's like a domino theory, but I know that when we saw it all together with this change in it, we thought, this is the way to go. I mean, we all, you know, like, across the board, said, now this is the way to do it. This is a great idea. Actress Julie Christie. It's a curious idea to have the same actress playing two different roles. It's a very uh, cinematic idea, and I, I don't know quite why he did it. You see? I mean, although it's not done a lot, I still see it as a cinematic idea, because it's a device, a, 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 a fantastic device for showing, you know, different sides of human beings, and why shouldn't all the roles be done by the same person, I mean, depending on sex? Um, because we could all be any of these people. We go, I mean, of course, we couldn't because of our genes and all that sort of stuff, but in a way, we could be. Who, who, you know, it's always surprising the way where people go, where the baby ends up. It's all this, in a way, it's, uh, it's to do with choice, isn't it? I mean, particularly in this case, whether you choose to be brainwashed or whether you keep at it, it's a choice. Whether you just watch television and accept all the stuff that the, that the uh, uh, media gives you, in this totally media-dominated world, or whether you're just fighting against it all the time. And it is a choice, but once again, of course. So, two sides possibly of the same character. But I think, actually, whether you fight against these things is a lot to do with your upbringing, genes and upbringing. You know, it's, it takes energy and uh, a really busy mind to keep fighting uh, the received information. Anyway, Linda certainly is wonderfully brainwashed, isn't she? And, it's, and what's marvellous is, is, I think, the, this is the best thing about the film, I think, this is the most prescient thing about the film, because it wasn't happening at the time, oh, is the way that she lives in the television world. She actually lives it. Her own world is, doesn't exist. And she lives in it, and we see that happening with these, this reality television now. It's all come true. I think Ray Bradbury just was brilliant to foresee that. It's interesting, isn't it, that now, in the US and UK, certainly, most people choose not to read books. Bradbury must have thought that for books to be a threat, what was going to happen in the future was that most people would, in this story, uh, most people retain free will. In other words, the threat is that if the books are there, people will choose to read them, to exercise their minds by reading. But in fact, most people have chosen not to read books. Of course, it's been replaced by other technology, but uh, reading. But um, I think partly it's to do with a kind of brainwashing. Uh, people like, uh, 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 very like Linda, I think she's wonderful, uh, that character, brainwashed by television. Um, and of course, there's, there's 
Probably more illiteracy in, uh, I mean, illiteracy is growing in certainly both the UK and US. I think that contributes enormously uh, to um, the lack of books being read. So it's to do with our education. And people can't concentrate anymore uh, on long enough to be able to to um, go from one thought to another. So these are things that I think this idea of burning books doesn't take into account. And uh, it, it, uh, it's interesting to ponder those things while, while, while you watch this film, because nobody ever knows which, what area anything is going to happen in. In fact, it hasn't happened quite like that, because of all those reasons. Naturally, in what you are about to see, any similarity with the truth... It's not books, I don't think, nowadays, that are the threat. I mean, a, a growing minority is reading, but clearly it doesn't constitute a threat. And even the old stories are kind of put through a, a mixer, which is not not exactly politically correct, but is full of saccharin. And the pips, the bitter pips, are all squeezed out. So we're pacified. Even the old, you know, the, story, the classics, which we now see on television. Whereas at the time, they might have been designed to trouble or make you think of things. They are now in some way pa made pacifying. So we do deal with it, but we're so clever that we don't need to do things like burn things. We are so incredibly clever. It's, we don't even know it's being done. We love the, the saccharin, just love it, and the pacifier. Lottie's children must go in with Helen's children, of course. Linda's absolutely right. Editor Tom Noble. I'd never really cut two pieces of film together. I mean, I'd done changes that the editor said, oh, you know, Stanley Donham wants foot taken off that shot or lose that scene. But to actually construct a scene, I'd never done it. Never. And so on the first day I was on that film, I had to cut all those, you know, one of those guys saying, what do you think, Linda? All that stuff I had to put together on, like, on the first day I was in the cutting room. So I go into the cutting room on the first day, and the first day I have to cut stuff. Like, not, they didn't let me in easily. Suddenly I had to do this, all these scenes where the guys on the TV screen are talking to Linda, and when she's part, she's act, reacting to them, you know, and they keep on turning to camera and saying, and what do you think, Linda? And she has to respond. But all that stuff had to go together, and all the sort of judo stuff that went before that had to go together, and the announcer. So I was like, oh my God, this is, I'm in at the deep end already. <laughs> so, God, if I can do this and this guy, it's fine. And I suddenly realized, I can do this. It's actually easy. You know, it's not a problem. I can do this. And uh, that's how it went from then on. It was like, and I thought that. You know, Francois would be with me every day and saying, you know, cut it here, do it here. But no, he actually left me to do exactly, and I would show it to him, and he'd say, oh, this is great, you know, whatever, let's move on, and whatever. Actress Julie Christie. Look at her, poor little thing. She's, she's a very uh, lost little soul. She's sincere, and she's very stupid. Very stupid people are sometimes sincere. <laughs> <laughs> I like my performance as her better than my performance. I hadn't got the other thing straight. I'd love to do the other part now because uh, I know so much more about that kind of thing. <laughs> about the dangerous life that girl was leading. Woo. Tough. Tough, tough to be a rebel like that. I mean, you know, whatever you are with you or in the Bader Meinhof or whatever. It's a tough, terrifying life to be living underneath in that kind of danger all the time. Like uh, she is. Producer Lewis M. Allen. The music uh, that goes wherever the fire truck runs. It's the same, it always hits there. And it's very, I think it's uh, what would seem something very flat. It makes it very exciting and dramatic and mo actually moving. And I remember we first screened it, we had uh, Mike Nichols came as invited us, who's an old friend. And uh, uh, when we were shooting that thing with the fire truck going along, I heard the sniffles, sniffles, and I looked back, and Mike was crying. He said it actually made him, uh, made him cry, the, 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 the music with the fire truck, the, that scene alone. Actress Julie Christie. 
It's so curious, the, the presentation of the fire engine, which is going to be crucial, the whole business of being a fireman and being a fire, and the fire engines, uh, the fact that, the, and the music that goes with it, terribly important, um, is both military, the, the choreography of the fireman is militaristic, the music is militaristic, and yet there's that uh, little bit of playful, almost, um, there's a sort of sound that is, that is almost playful in the same way that the fire engine is designed by the designer Tony Walton um, to be like a toy. And the shooting is very militaristic, the choreography is terrifically militaristic, the music is both militaristic and kind of slightly childlike as well. Better do for a day, go back to your desks. What's this? Um, it's interesting oh, that uh, this business of not having friends sitting next to each other, because, of course, uh, if um, I mean? people have things in common sit next to each other, there is a possibility of communication, isn't there? And communication seems to be exactly what, this society, what the society of this film is trying to destroy. Let us refuse uh, any communication except that of state uh, um, communication. And, you know, it happens a little bit in schools. I know it happens in schools. I know that people in, in schools um, prefer best friends not to sit together. Um, where else has it happened? I'm sure it happens in sweatshops that you don't have best friends sitting together because they could possibly talk and, um, and lose precious time. It's not so much, I don't think, to do with communication, it's to do with the ever-present profit motive, which, in a way, isn't apparent in this film, because that's the dominant thing in our lives now. I suppose Bradbury's vision of this hell would have been influenced by history up to that point, i.e., no, um, particular hells that he, or perhaps he considered to be, you know, Nazism and maybe uh, Stalinism. Producer Lewis M. Allen. I know that Truffaut was a bit disturbed that it seemed overly military looking, that, uh, as you say, kind of Nazi, and he did not want to make this a political statement. He was not interested in that at all, though I think Oscar Werner thought it should be done uh, a little tougher. I think he felt it was a thing against fascism, a kind of statement against fascism, that Truffaut was not really, did not really want the uh, part of the captain. Interestingly enough, the, um, the English actors were, were unbelievably nice. That is, I'd offered it to Olivier. He called and said, come around. He was doing Othello at the National Theater then, which is, of course was an enormous uh, job with a great makeup. And he said, come around and see me after the show. Well, I went to, up to see him, after, went backstage after the show. He came out sweating and pouring off and took me in the dressing room and sat and talked to me for 15 minutes before he even took his makeup off. And I thought that was extraordinarily generous at why he couldn't, explain to me why he couldn't, his commitment said he couldn't do it. And I know the commitments are real because I have found out subsequently. Michael uh, Redgrave, the same thing. He took Truffaut and me out to lunch on the rooftop garden of a hotel and went into great lengths to explain why he, uh, he couldn't do it because he had uh, certain skin problems that, at that time. But uh, I thought that was extraordinary because dealing with American actors and so on mostly, you can only get agents. You, you, they're very hard. I was very impressed with that and it made working in London uh, uh, so much more uh, agreeable. Yes, sir? And what about hockey? Do you like hockey? Yes, I do, sir. And golf? Golf? Uh, very much, sir. Mm, and football? Wonderful, sir. Editor Tom Noble. Cyril Cusack um, was perfectly cast in this thing. He's incredibly affable, but there's so much going on underneath. Very, very tricky. I mean, it was the most brilliant bit of casting because he isn't one kind terribly sympathetic, but you see, you know, the first time you see him like beating up those kids behind that glass, he's quite a character, you know. And, but he's so sort of evilly 
you know, the way he says, and I must give you my personal medallion. <laughs> I always remember that. And I always thought when I was actually making, the, you know, doing the picture, I thought, God, I'd love to get one of those, you know, like I'd love to have one of Syracuse's personal medallions. <laughs> but no, I thought he was, he was absolutely brilliantly cast. Actress Julie Christie. If you do the right thing, you're going to get, go up the ladder. I, I'm thinking now, in these days, uh, for instance, um, all this sort of um, spying, if you like, and to find out if, in fact, he's worthy, if he's clean enough to um, be promoted. There's such echoes of it all, all over the world now. Actually, there are echoes in America where um, mm, the, the uh, people who check luggage at, at, at airports are all being, I, I, and as, as I understand it, are being uh, their private firms, they're being recalled, and federal employees are being are replacing them because the background of federal employees is checked out so much more intensively. Um, and that's much as, the same as, the, as this, really. Whatever reason one gives for it, it's, the same thing is going on. Similarly, it's uh, occurring all the time all over the world in, in labour are constantly employing these kind of tactics. And if you don't do the right thing, in other words, if you complain at all or if you are known to be doing something slightly um, against the uh, labour practices set up, you are... Um, I mean, this is a fact, and it's happening all over the world, um, as we know. You, you are sacked. So it's, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not fantasy, this, this stuff at all. And I guess it, 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 it never has been and it, and it never will be. Editor Tom Noble. My sound, chief sound editor, supervisor editor, was this guy called Norman Wonstall. Norman Wonstall, I think, had by then actually won an Oscar for one of the Bond pictures. That was, he did a very good thing for when Montauk comes back and finds uh, Lindris overdosed. There's that sound of that TV that's on that's a really horrible sound that really eats into you. That's really good, that particular sound that he got for that. Producer Lewis M. Allen. I remember specifically when he said, you know, I'm going to use these old-fashioned telephones instead of, uh, uh, of contemporary ones. And he did this gradually. These things came along. And the, the razor that uh, Montag has, the old-fashioned straight razor, they just kind of slowly developed in his head as we got close to the shooting. Yes, it's about my wife. She... Editor Tom Noble. Norman Wonstall comes from that school of English sound editing, which is known as the Wind Rider School. I mean, basically, the Wind Rider School of sound editing goes like this. If somebody is pouring red wine into a glass in the film, you pour red wine into a glass on the Foley stage. If somebody drops a handkerchief 500 yards down the road, you record it. So you have everything. Right? So. I thought, well, this is a good guy to have, really and truly, because with Francois, you never quite know what he wants, so if he's got everything, it'll be fine. So we go on to the dubbing stage. And in those days, if you made a mistake in a 900-foot reel, you went back to the beginning again. OK, so we start. So there's all these effects come up. You know, there's, a, like, there's not only the fire engine, but there's a siren for it. There's rattling from the, all the ladders and things on it. There's the engine sound from it. There's everything, like, like 15, 25 effects. Francois goes absolutely insane. What's all this? I told him I only wanted the sound of the wheels. So I said, it's going to be like this for the rest of the thing. OK, so I said, J you'll just be, like, listening to the stuff, throw it out, throw it out, throw it out, but it will always be there. This is the way English sound editors work. So he said, oh, God. You know. So anyway, we go through, and, like, we mix the first reel just like that because we've thrown everything out that he had. And I never, he said to me, oh, my God, when he heard the fireman's footsteps, he said, I told Norman particularly, he said, I, if I see seven firemen walking, I only want to hear the sound of three men's footsteps. And we have, like, 40. First class pump out. <laughs> We're throwing all this stuff out. It was the most amazing thing. You just like winnowed, like gone, gone. No, don't want to hear that. Don't want to hear that. Don't want to hear that. That's out. That's out. Keep that. Keep that. Get rid of that. Get rid of that. And it was like that. It was a very simple mix in the end. Actress Julie Christie. Interesting, isn't it? The way the um, Francois sees the medical profession as as being complicit. It's really not being um, skilled people at all. I mean, then those are like thugs, aren't they? The people in this uh, 
film and their horrible plastic outfits, which um, are kind of just totally functional and not um, threatening. They're, they're very frightening, those, those outfits, and it, more or less you know what they're doing just to look at their outfits. There's nothing psychologically um, comforting in them at all. Perhaps what he's seeing is a medical profession that has been put under such stress and so abused as public medicine is and, public and the, and the uh, people who serve in it, um, made so tough, almost physically impossible to endure. I mean, the hours they're asked to work for the little bit of money. But in fact, maybe what he's thinking is that in the end it'll just be sort of thugs going about a sort of business just like plumbers. Stephen C. Smith, Bernard Herrmann, biographer. There wasn't a composer in Hollywood who was more effective at conveying the anxiety that accompanies desire than Bernard Herrmann. If you think about a film like Vertigo, that's a movie where start to finish, Bernard Herrmann is creating a tremendous sense of, of anxiety in the audience as we watch this man pursue a woman and the desire that he's feeling. Fahrenheit has an interesting sequence with, uh, with Julie Christie uh, as Linda in, in, that I think is similar in a way. This isn't a traditional romantic scene, and Herrmann does not write traditional romantic music. Instead, Instead, he, he writes music that is passionate but denies us a, a kind of emotional resolution. I mean, so many of his music cues for Hitchcock and in Fahrenheit uh, don't resolve, and they create a sense of, of non-resolution in the viewer that is, is very deliberate and very effective. I brought you a present. Editor Tom Noble. When we first see Linda watching TV, she's watching some demonstration of self-defense that sort of judo thing. And when she actually throws him on the bed, she actually does one of those little moves on him that she's seen in the television thing and throws him down. But it's actually, it's, it's, when you think about it, nowadays, it's like, it's such an innocent little scene. I mean, what happens is she throws him on the bed, she starts to undo his robe, and they hug. And that's, that's it. That's the sex, that's not any sex in the entire movie sort of thing. So it's, it's very, very strange. And, and there's all that business about the bath is filling up with all this foam and everything, and the music is playing this incredibly lush music. Think, what in the hell is going on here? And that was, I mean, no, that, I was in that session where Francois was explaining to, to Bernard Herrmann, you know, what he wanted at this scene. And I think Bernard Herrmann was looking like, what? You know, this, is, this is completely over the top. And it was really over the top. I mean, I think if you saw it now, um, it would be like a Monty Python scene, you know, because the music is absurd with what is happening actually on that bed. Absurd. I mean, it just reaches a crescendo that is out of this world. <laughs> Producer Lewis M. Allen. The fact is that Bernie Herrmann's music then in, indicate the, the visual aspect looks like they're having something, uh, something really essential going on. The music indicates at the end that it really doesn't happen. It doesn't really happen. There is something wrong there. And I know that's exactly what Truffaut wanted. He did not want to play that as a kind of sex scene. You burn. Actress Julie Christie. This business of have you actually read the books? Have you ever read a book? Reminds me of. Uh, hey. We've had in Britain um, a, a lot of people um, who've been particularly one, who've been on kind of anti-pornography campaigns. That is, they they can't. I mean, the slightest thing they just can't stand that has to do with sex, which is uh, which is on screen. Um, and uh, we, we've had one, two people, or two women I can think of in particular, who've, read, who've led very, very, very virulent campaigns against uh, various pretty harmless uh, films and television programs. And um, when they're asked if they've seen these things, they've never seen them. <laughs> so I think that's interesting, the fact that he answers no, he wouldn't, and they wouldn't, because they know it's bad. They just know it's bad. I read a lot of books I'm never not reading. Uh, books are my major distraction. I haven't recently, I must say, watched uh, Francois' movies for a long time, but I've always loved his work. I love, I love um, 
the wild child, L'Enfant Sauvage. Really love it. I'd love to see that again. No, he used um, long lens very significantly in that. So sad that Truffaut died so early. Such a, such an artist, so beautiful. And I always feel so full of compassion, in a way that almost no other director quite has uh, Truffaut's compassion. I don't think, and his, the beauty of his filmmaking, the gentleness. Author Ray Bradbury. If people ask me what Francois Truffaut was like. I would say, go see Close Encounters for a Third Kind. The Truffaut that's in the film, this angelic creature, this ephemeral creature who looks up at the sky for God coming down. Huh? And that, that's not just a spaceship. And you have Truffaut looking up as into a cathedral. Huh? And that mysterious Truffaut, that gentle Truffaut. I had dinner with him in Paris about a year before he died. And I fell more completely in love with him at every meeting. He was a sweetheart, a lovely, lovely man. And I'm so sorry that I didn't have a chance to spend more time with him. Editor Tom Noble. The first time um, he reads David Copperfield, Feel. Well, the first time we see him, and I think it's wonderful that he reads it by the light of the TV. That's, so there's something quite magical about that. And also, it's that, that whole thing about being in this sort of robe that's kind of monkish, and whatever. Um, and you think to yourself, well, this is a tricky moment, because how does he know how to read for the first thing? So, and I think Francois handled it absolutely brilliantly, because when he opens the title page, I mean, we all know as readers, we just look at the title and we go on to the first page of the book. But he very, like, you know, reads every single bit, you know, published by Chapman and Hall or whatever, you, you know, edition in New York by so and so and so and so and so and so and reads and they, you know, date and everything. Then he turns the page and David Copperfield and then, you know, he starts to read. I think, no, actually it works. Actress Julie Christie. I suppose that one of the reasons he's reading David Copperfield, that it could have been a much older book, is so that we can see this lovely old print, uh, which which conveys in some way the longevity of um, the written word, of the printed word, of books. Editor Tom Noble. I very rarely went on the set. You know, it's one of those things. And, and, and the, as it was my first film, I didn't really know this, but... Um, it's something that I've actually stuck to ever since, in a strange way, that I don't go to the set if I can avoid it. Because one of the things I think it does for you is, if you go on the set and there you see them setting up a shot and it takes them all morning to get it, that shot comes your way, you, you think you'd better use it because it took them so much trouble. But if you don't know that and you look at it and think, that doesn't work, you find another way of constructing it, you see? And I think that's really good because on, on the other hand, on the set, you're, what are you going to do? You know, unless it's a, like a first time director wants you there. Because he says, look, I'm thinking of doing this. Will this cut with this? Fine. But somebody that knows what they're doing, you, there's no place for you there, really and truly. I mean, you're just, you're wasted. You're just watching other people work, you know. Come on. We used to run like at Pinewood Studios at the end of a shoot, you know, and we'd finish reasonably, like six o'clock in the evening. There would be a screening at something like 6.30 or 7 of some, film that he wanted to see again and you know of course because Universal would just produce anything for him that he wanted to see so you know he'd say I, here's my list of <laughs> she's got pictures I want to see this week or next week or whatever and you know that would be what we do in the evenings we'd watch all these Hitchcock movies and it was like an education for me because to watch them with Truffaut is very different from watching them just up there because he knows the film's backwards. He's like, oh, this is really interesting. I mean it's like DVDs are now, you know, he's talking you through the Hitchcock movie. <laughs> So he was way ahead of his time. <laughs> Producer Lewis M. Allen. Truffaut, he was, um, along with the other gang of the new wave, uh, uh, were very much influenced by American films. I think Truffaut, more than, than most, technically, and in this particular case, uh, did do various tricks. But um, all those uh, new wave directors, this just incidentally, um, 
I met almost all of them. Godard would come over almost every weekend, though he was shooting a film in France, he would come over and visit every weekend. Philippe de Broca came a few times, and we'd see them back in Paris. Jacques Demy, Agnes, Agnes Varda, and uh, um, a lot of them, you know, they were hanging around. They were it's a wonderful group. I mean, they sort of supported everybody, who supported everybody else at that point. And then Suzanne Schiffman was, had worked with him very closely in, uh, in France, and of course, uh, he wanted her there because she was, she was uh, his French sidekick, so to speak. I mean, who, professional sidekick. Helen Scott, of course, he was very close to and was there with us all the way through. But Helen was not a, a film person, per se. She was not an expert, whereas Suzanne was uh, technically uh, very knowledgeable and, uh, and was uh, around and very helpful to him on the technical side. Author Ray Bradbury. Well, my first impression of the film was uh, that I liked it very much. Uh, I believe that Julie Christie was fine as the wife, but that I criticized the fact that he turned Julie Christie into the girl next door to Clarice McClellan. She was the wrong age. The fun in the relationship of Clarice and Montag is she's a naive girl of 16 who wanders around like a beautiful sap, huh? And you look at this girl, she doesn't know what she's doing, but she does. So intuitively, she's teaching Montag this love of books. She doesn't realize how powerful she is. And the fun comes from an older man learning from a kid who's not a teacher, but by her actions is a teacher. So there, that's the ironic fun. If you have an older woman do that, it doesn't count because the older woman is smart, you know, and she's doing it on purpose. Uh, that's not the relationship I wanted. You know, it's funny. It reminded me of something. A girl who used to wait for a soldier. By Actress Barry Julie Christie. Fabian's betrayal. Um, is is a phenomenon that is uh, growing in modern society too. Um, whereas we used to not be encouraged to betray each other. It used to be a terrible thing to do. Betrayal used to be a terrible thing to do, and now it's encouraged. It's all to do with the profit motive. But, um, for instance, in England particularly, um, there's, there's a, there's a, people are encouraged, actually encouraged and unashamed of telling newspapers about their sexual exploits with um, famous people. I think that's exactly the same sort of license to betray as there is in this film. Absolutely no shame about it at all, like Fabian has no shame. And um, in England, they set up a hotline for people to ring in if they felt their neighbours or they noticed anybody was um, fiddling the... What's he doing? Um, social security, their social security. You know, if, if they thought someone was having a job, actually, when they were going to collect their social security, for, uh, their unemployment money. There was actually a hotline set up. And it, it, it resounded with calls. It was, I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people rang in. So it's... Um, it's not only in this science fiction world, this... Very formal, militaristic, a sort of slightly Nazi Germany, slightly uh, Russian world that it happens. It happens in our world, only it's got a very different, unformalized texture in our world. But it's, it's just as uh, Make up your mind. corrupting to the individuals. There. What a relief. Now he's got rid of his noisy neighbor, of his brother-in-law, he's got a bit of job away from his mother. Why not? Producer Lewis M. Allen. My wife is uh, Jay Preston Allen, and uh, at that time she had written Marnie. And of course, uh, at that time also, Truffaut was doing his book of interviews with Hitchcock. And uh, in fact, we were out there when some of those were being done. So uh, uh, Truffaut thought, well, he did Marnie, she did Marnie, I'll try him on the script. Uh, the fact was that uh, it didn't work out simply because Jay writes very much in a kind of a current dialogue, uh, naturalistic dialogue, and Truffaut wanted no personality. He wanted this to be totally neutral, totally flat dialogue, uh, because if people didn't read, he thought they should not be very articulate. 
And uh, of course, I think that was, uh, they punted very, very amicably. I mean, after a week, uh, Jay said you, she wanted to do it one way, and he, uh, of course, wanted something totally different. But uh, that's the way it was. But I think that was one of the, uh, to me, one of the real dramatic problems of the movie. I don't want to talk about the negatives, because there are lots of uh, wonderful things about the movie. But I don't know how you overcome making a film dramatic when you're doing very, very simple and flat dialogue. And then, of course, he had a more success, I believe, in Paris. He did a really a wonderful job of dubbing it back into in the language he knows, his own language. Uh, I, knew, I know that Helen Scott was practically destroyed by the review in The New Yorker, by um, Pauline Kael's review, which was not bad, but it was mixed. And she was an old friend of Helen Scott's, and I remember being in Helen's room, and she's lying on the bed, practically screaming, and Pauline is saying, Helen, it's not that bad, not that bad a review. So Helen took it very personally. I just don't know about Francois. He was always reserved about that sort of thing. You know, he was almost like a, uh, for somebody you think of as a brilliant kind of a genius, he's not what you call artistic with the, with the uh, quotation marks. He was very practical minded. Okay. That uh, camera crane, again, it was one of those things that he more or less improvised. He, he thought that'll make a wonderful prop, so there he sticks it in the film. He did a lot of things like that that were not uh, uh, not really in scripted. And uh, as I say, I think it's because he was frustrated about not being able to change and work on the script itself that he did various visual insertions. That's Robert. I was not, uh, when I did see the thing, finally, I was not... Uh, uh, disturbed, particularly, I thought the reviews for the most part were, 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 were fair enough. I mean, I've always had those reservations, though it's a wonderful film about the language, uh, the language and the fact that there is no really emotional, no naked woman in it, as he, as he used to say. <laughs> uh, and uh, so I, I did not think those uh, reviews in, in light, uh, commercial reviews were unfair, particularly. Of course, when you're that close to a film, you're making it, you really don't know how it's going to turn out very much. It's very difficult to tell, you're just inside it. There was another shot in the school hall when you went down and there you saw uh, the actor who was one of the uh, firemen in drag with a wig looking out of the window. And uh, it was, uh, very amusing, and I, I never knew why he did that, and I think he just did it because he was just thought it was fun. <laughs> Editor Tom Noble. Francois had this great idea one day, let's put Anton Differing in a blonde wig and make him a school teacher, and just opens that blind and is gone again. So it's like, he's the, the, like his nemesis. Actress Julie Christie. The problem with freedom of speech is that it's so hatefully distorted. Everything has a back and a front. There is no um, nothing that's perfect. I, I actually think one of the biggest evils of our lives, because I live in England, is the tabloid newspapers and the things they do to private people, ruining their lives. Um, much in the way here, someone found reading a book would have their life ruined, as that poor girl has her life ruined. The children don't talk to her anymore. Heart's broken and the lies told in the freedom to lie and the freedom to wound and the freedom to destroy goes along with the freedom to convey all sorts of knowledge, unfortunately. And um, in a way, uh, the tabloid journalists in England are very like these um, firemen um, with their long-distance lenses, they're everywhere, they're in people's homes, they're outside people's homes, they do this kind of thing, they look in dustbins, they look through dustbins. They uh, will print what is heard in um, over the telephone. Dreadful, dreadful, dreadful stuff. So that's freedom of speech. It's not all, um, it's not all wonderful. Remember? Last night I read one. Stephen C. Smith, Bernard Herman, biographer. There's a tremendous dramatic challenge in Fahrenheit 451, and that is how to make the audience feel that it's, it's the most dangerous thing in the world to be reading a book or found to be reading a book. 
uh, I think Bernard Herrmann's music is really what makes us feel this. I mean, we can be told this, but it's the music that makes us feel this. And when Werner confesses at one point, I should say, when Werner's character at one point confesses that he's read a book, Herrmann really gives us a strong cue here that, that really underscores the, the, the drama and the danger of this. Uh, is, it, is it a bold stroke? Is it very big? Is it the kind of thing that some composers wouldn't have done? Yes, but Herrmann knew it was absolutely essential to convey that this is a turning point, and the music does that tremendously well throughout this score. Editor Tom Noble. Oh, I loved his scores, actually. I really did. I thought always his music was incredible. It drove the film always. When nothing really was happening, he drove it in the most extraordinary way. And I thought, I thought he was brilliant. But, you know, at the first, when you meet him, he's actually a very crotchety person, you know, and he keeps on telling you how he did the score for Citizen Kane and all that sort of thing. So... What are you doing, Linda? You, he, the, the man is nothing like the music. I mean, well, I'm really saying it. Out of him comes this extraordinary music, and it's so unlike him. If you could pick something, who wrote that? You know, you'd think, that man wrote that music? It's extraordinary. I mean, I really think it was good. When did we first meet? And where? Author Ray Bradbury. I think the, the test for this score is if you put it on and listen to it by itself, so you immediately see the film, huh? Oh, that's right. You can't do that with all scores of all films. No, no, that's but right. Herman had it, Steiner had it, Miklas Rosa had it. But, but for, for specific films, and in the case of Fahrenheit, it, the score stands by itself, and you add it back to the film, and you have a perfection. A good title for my book and a good title for the film would be Love Story. It's a story of a man in love with books in the library. It's not a story about Clarice McClellan. It's a story about Mildred. It's a story about a man falling in love with books. And that's what makes it work because those of us who love libraries and books respond immediately to this quiet passion, this gathering of knowledge and the gathering of love. So the title shouldn't be Fahrenheit, it should be Love Story. Actress Julie Christie. Hmm, it's odd that the pole is like a, uh, it's like a real thing, isn't it? It's like, <laughs> it's like a spy itself. Author Ray Bradbury. Along the way, I had a chance to adapt the novel into a play for Charles Lawton, my hero. He's a fantastic actor, a wonderful director. And I did a version of it, but I follow the novel much too closely. You can't do that for the stage. You can do that perhaps for the screen better, because the metaphors carry over. And I gave it to him and his producer, and they took me out one night and got me drunk and told me how bad the play was. And I went home with tears streaming down my cheeks because I wanted to work for him so badly. And then later, the next time I did the Fahrenheit for the stage, it worked because I didn't meticulously copy out of the book. And then I did an opera after that with my friend Georgia Holoff and David Matti. And the opera has been appearing all over the country. And it is a very fine piece of work also. Editor Tom Noble. The amazing thing is, you know, that little boy that says that terrible line about, oh, there's a fire engine, there's going to be a fire, <laughs> right? Was Mark Lester, you know, the little boy that was in Oliver later. There's going to be a fire. And he's also the second little boy in when she's walking down the corridor that runs past her. So that's at the beginning of a, of a career <laughs> at that moment. Producer Louis M. Allen. Nick Rogue, of course, was a cinematographer, and he spoke French so he could talk to Truffaut. And afterwards, when we'd finish shooting, he'd go to the pub at the Pinewood every evening and sit, stay there drinking as long as anybody would stay up with him. So, I mean, he was just uh, wonderful to, to have around. And, of course, subsequently, he's become quite a significant uh, director on his own. Actress Julie Christie. Oh, he's a very interesting man, Nick Rogue. I mean, his... Uh, I did a lot of films with Nick as photographer, um, quite a few. We've, uh, we've, we've always been friends, we're friends still. Um, 
You can tell what an interesting man he is from his films, from his photography and from his films. He's a, he's a very... Um, he's not a predictable person. I don't mean by that he's, un he's, uh, he's uh, shaky. I don't mean that that's sort of unpredictable, but he's uh, original. That's what he is. He's not predictable because he's an original person with original thinking, original thoughts. He and Francois got on very well indeed. She's certainly worth looking at anyway. This is uh, B. Duffel playing this part. B. Duffel, a great name. A woman with a great face. She's presented as a kind of um, different shape to me, as if we're the same, as if we're clones, uh, uh, sort of clones, but not, not exactly the same, but we're uh, same hairstyle, etc. This reminds me of people whose houses are raided because uh, they're suspected of having drugs there. Same sort of sort of misconception of evil placed on books as is placed on uh, uh, marijuana nowadays. Down there, throw them all down. Producer Lewis M. Allen. Truffaut loved adored books along with movies. I mean, those were the two things. Uh, uh, I've been to bookstores with him, and he died. Uh, also, the, the thing that amused me when we were particularly when we were preparing the film we were in Paris. I stayed with him in Paris before, and it was at his office during the day and stayed at his apartment. But he would have the schedule of every, every film playing in Paris that he wanted to see. It would be blocked out, and we'd be going along, and he suddenly looked at his watch and say, oh, 2 o'clock, and we'd get in, the, <laughs> get in a cab and rush to this theater and see the movie and come back to the office again. This went on, you know, uh, regularly with him, which was kind of, it was fun, and at the same time, you understand why he, uh, how he knew so much. Editor Tom Noble. I think that was a revelation because we'd never seen that many books in one house before. And, you know, obviously, and Cyril Cusack is relishing it as well. Ah, oh, I remember, I heard about this sort of thing, you know, and going there. And you could see that he really was, there was a part of him that was really almost wanted to read <laughs> those books as well because there were so many of them. I mean, it was a tiny set, I remember that. I mean, it was, he, it was tiny. People could barely move in that set. But it was brilliant because it was somehow... All you'd ever seen was, you know, just a couple of books here, or maybe, you know, in the opening sequence, maybe he had 30 books. But now, this was a whole attic library of stuff. It was just amazing how they both reacted to that. I mean, Cyrus Cusack was, like, relishing every moment, explaining, you know, all these books made you unhappy, and they were just sort of scaphantic books, or they were just people relishing their own, you know, brilliance and whatever, and they were just horrible things. And yet, he was intrigued by them, too. You know, there was something wonderful about them that he felt that he would love to be just left here on his own so he could look through them. <laughs> This house is condemned. They're said to burn the books right here with everything else. Well, burning the house is one thing. Burning the books is another, isn't it? It's never any good burning everything together. DVD producer Laurent Bouzereau. I wanted to tell you guys a few stories about the making of Fahrenheit 451 and uh, some stories of Francois Truffaut. Only I am right. The others are all... Those stories are kind of uh, at random. And uh, let's start with the beginning. Uh, Francois Truffaut first got interested in Fahrenheit 451 after he finished his third feature-length film, Jewels and Jim, in 1961. Uh, he found out about the novel through a producer friend of his named Raoul Levy. So Truffaut bought the rights of the book in 1962, but he abandoned the project after several drafts uh, were written and turned to another film. Fahrenheit 451 was then revived with the producer Louis M. Allen, and uh, Truffaut got back on board with him, uh, and they made the movie. At the time François Truffaut made Fahrenheit 451, he had made the following films. A short picture entitled Les Mistons in 1958, The 400 Blows in 1959, Shoot the Piano Player in 1960, Jules and Jim in 1961, 
which was followed by a short uh, segment uh, called Love at 20 in 1962, which was presented with other segments directed by other directors. He also made The Soft Skin in 1964, um, a movie starring Françoise Dorliac, who was uh, Catherine Deneuve's sister. And Fine Height 451 uh, came out in 1966. Both The 400 Blows and Jules and Jim were international success. Should the piano player and the soft skin, on the other hand, although considered classics today, were not as well received. For those of you uh, wondering about the title, The 400 Blows, it is a literal translation of a French expression meaning to do all kinds of mischiefs. To do the 400 blows is applied to kids, mainly, who are constantly getting into trouble, like the hero of Truffaut's movie, uh, The 400 Blows, um, Antoine Duanel. Go ahead. Francois Truffaut hated science fiction. Uh, it's interesting, uh, considering that he starred in one of the best science fiction movies, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. But at the time he made Fahrenheit 451, uh, he did not like science fiction. He wrote an article, actually, against science fiction in a French magazine named Arts, Art in French. Uh, his only weakness was for a movie called The Thing, Howard Hawks' The Thing. Truffaut's theory against science fiction claimed, why look to the universe for emotions when we have them all here on Earth? To him, Fahrenheit 451 was a fable, not science fiction. Interestingly enough, Ray Bradbury declares that Fahrenheit 451 is a science fiction novel, unlike The Martian Chronicles, another one of his classic books, which he always thought of as a myth rather than science fiction. Go figure. Producer Lewis M. Allen. Uh, that sequence with the old lady in the house and the balcony and then coming down and being burned was, was a very uh, touchy one. I mean, it was, uh, we had a lot of technical support uh, in that about using the fire and, of course, uh, uh, it was, uh, there was a considerable amount of danger involved in that. She was fantastic because we had a lot of little uh, spouts of fire going around, kerosene fires that flamed, them. but film from back here made it look like it was burning all over. She did that scene about, I don't know, seven or eight times I, I was there, and uh, uh, she was very brave about it, I must say. Much braver than Oscar Werner, who was on the outside of it and was, uh, didn't want to get close. And uh, again, we had to use uh, reverse the film at one point and use a double and so on on that. Actress Julie Christie. This is like the um, monk who burned himself in Vietnam in protest at the, the war. She's absolutely sure of her rightness. It's like a dance, isn't it? Beautiful. It's funny because, uh, I mean, just thinking as I watch this scene, what this film is about is uh, the destruction of communication and knowledge. And I was thinking, we watch it now at a time when there is more, more information than there's ever been before, but in a way, you too, not more knowledge, possibly less knowledge, not than there's ever been before, obviously not, um, because we're learning so quickly and so many things. And, but um, there's been, I think there's been a, 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 um, a reversal of um, the amount of knowledge people have. Producer Lewis M. Allen. The television is right on the wall, yes. Uh, my recollection is that it was projected from behind, yes. I mean, it was just, uh, I think they filmed it on a TV screen and then projected behind, you couldn't put it in the room, actually. Actress Julie Christie. I quite like these ladies and I love the way it looks. This kind of very formal um, 
arrangement, like the cover of one of those 30s books written uh, for women about um, all these wonderful modern designs like uh, Hoover's and uh, these, the, at, at the outbreak of all this stuff that was being produced after the war for, for women to use, domestic appliances, there were these little books with all these ideas and uh, they, were, they included sort of buying stuff for your house, chairs and tables and things, modernism, and that's what that picture looked like. Columbia University professor Annette Insdorf. First and foremost, Truffaut was very shy. Um, much like many of the male characters in his films, Charlie and Shoot the Piano Player, or Antoine Duanel for that matter. Um, and I think he was always far more comfortable reading a good book or watching a movie than engaging in conversation, unless the conversation was about movies or books. In Fahrenheit, I think some of that becomes visible because um, there is an ambiguity inherent in the theme of Fahrenheit 451. Yes, on the one hand, it is an indictment of a society that would burn books, deny individual freedom, etc. On the other hand, though, the question that the captain raises, namely, don't books make people unhappy? Um, aren't books of philosophy, each one announcing, I am right? Um, Aren't people less likely to be able to get along with others if they are reading? Of course, the answer is partly yes to all of those questions. Um, one could say that maybe Truffaut is acknowledging that his own obsession with books is on the one hand exalting and on the other hand antisocial and perhaps not the most wonderful thing to be obsessed with. I think one of the reasons that Truffaut wanted to make this film was to celebrate not only literature in general, the way that books should be a central part of our identities, but also specific books that he always loved. And so when I see in Fahrenheit 451 titles like um, Plexus of Henry Miller or Lolita, or uh, books of Jean Genet, um, or Madame Bovary. These are books or authors that have had trouble in their own times because so much controversy arose around the publication of their books. So I think Truffaut is calling attention to the fact that individual texts have been menaced in every era, including the so-called modern era, which didn't know what to do with Henry Miller, so basically we banned him. So Truffaut is celebrating not just Alice in Wonderland, but Madame Bovary, a book which was itself a denunciation of romantic novels. I mean, one of the things Flaubert was suggesting was that Emma Bovary became the character that she was because she read too many romantic novels in the convent and it basically ruined her for a normal life. So he's invoking and evoking a number of different things there. Even though I know he was thrilled to be celebrating the written word, something that was so crucial to him throughout his life. I mean, even when he was a boy, he would play hooky to do one of two things, either to sneak into a movie theater and watch a film, or to, to go to the library and sneak a book. In other words, you know, reading Hugo or Balzac was a kind of salvation for him as a child. So he did something wonderful in this film. But he never, I think, was completely satisfied with the way it turned out. Actress Julie Christie. This is like people listening to someone who've got a different political idea and they... It's almost painful to their ears. They've been so isolated, these people, that they can't... They're actually physically hurt by this... by the truth or by knowledge. It's physically hurting them because they've been so isolated from it. They've lived in such protected shells. It was very strong up on me. And my aunt had left her with a parting cry, oh, goodbye, little blossom. Those people are wonderful example, those women, of people who have... Cried to think. ..who are simply not using this fabulous thing we've been given, which is a brain. And how did blossom... And something can... Uh, we see that brain suddenly activated and the... ..what it does to them. I knew that's what would happen. It's what I've always said. Life isn't like novels, novels and tears, novels and suicide. Novels are sick. That was sheer cruelty, Montag. You're a cruel man. All those words, idiotic words, evil words that hurt people. 
Isn't there enough trouble as it is? Why disturb people with that sort of filth? Poor Doris. If you are kept in isolation from certain knowledge, it's, as she says, you're a cruel man, Montag. It's, um, it's uh, sometimes very painful to realize that the world is not quite what you thought it was. Their imaginations have been um, stultified, haven't they? And that poor woman's imagination was suddenly activated, which put her in touch with her feelings. And I think uh, we live in a society where imagination is um, being constantly diminished by the by television output, quite simply. I've got to read. I've got to catch up with the remembrance of the past. Stephen C. Smith, Bernard Herrmann, biographer. Throughout Fahrenheit, there are moments in the music that remind us of Herman's great score for Psycho, uh, the, the tremendous anxiety that's felt, in this case, by o Oscar Werner. And the nightmare sequence is, is perhaps the best illustration of that in the way that Herman writes this relentless, hammering, deliberately repetitious music. And in this case, it has a, an interesting and different color, which is this almost childlike nursery game sound, as Herman said, that is almost like the sound of mocking children. And again, I, I think he's acknowledging the sort of simplicity universe that they're living in and uh, it's it's a tremendously effective sequence Producer Lewis M. Allen. The nightmare sequence of, uh, of Julie Christie being burned in the books and all that, I don't, I don't recall that being in the script even. I have a funny feeling that Truffaut, that came to him later and he more or less improvised it. You know, of course, that on most of these films, he did rewrites and writes the night before the film. And in this case, of course, being in English, he couldn't do those rewrites and he was kind of more or less. And so I think a certain frustration, he. He, he made certain in insertions that were visual and they're not uh, on the, in the script. This film had so much, uh, his films before were fairly naturalistic with very little uh, natural, naturalistic sets and so on. This had to have so much built. The, the, the fire truck had to be special. The rooms, the layout of the rooms and uh, of the uh, houses and the, every, all that had to be designed and built. And of course, he could not really supervise all that totally. I mean, it was one of those things that part of it, he would talk to them and so on, but they would come up and maybe not be just exactly what he wanted by any means. The same thing with the interiors um, that were, uh, he felt were uh, overly decorated. He wanted to, for example, just to have uh, the sofas had pillows brought up from the dressing rooms and tossed on as they had done. And uh, the pillows were, in fact, Overzealously, they were individually designed and made, and this and that and the other, which was uh, upset him considerably. So he had to r remove some of those things. But he did what he could to change, but uh, change things. But uh, some of it was beyond his control. Columbia University professor Annette Insdorf. Truffaut was deeply concerned with continuity of all kinds. In his own biographical life, I mean, continuity was a troublesome thing for him. He knew early on that his so-called father was not his biological father. But he didn't know who the biological father was until right after Fahrenheit 451, he hired a private detective, uh, the, the same detective agency that was involved in Stolen Kisses, and he found out that his biological father was a Jewish doctor, dentist, that, that he had never met. So there was a rupture in a certain continuity personally. And then in terms of the way that he made lists of his favorite books and his favorite films, creating journals, diaries, the way that it was so important to, to him to have memory itself and cumulative experience. Well, those are precisely the things that are lacking at the beginning of Fahrenheit 451. Look, last night, you were talking in your sleep. Don't forget that in so many of Truffaut's films, including Fahrenheit 451, the male is rarely presented as a strong, macho hero. 
I mean, they are all flawed heroes to one extent or another. And if Montag faints in Fahrenheit, well, this is not so different from, let's say, in the soft skin, the way that Pierre Lachenay is like a little boy when he wants to ask out for a drink, Nicole, the stewardess played by Françoise d'Orléac, the way that he calls her up in the hotel, and when she says yes, the way he turns on all the lights in his hotel room. I mean, there's something so touching in the adolescent, boyish exaltation. Editor Tom Noble. That incredible woman, the next door neighbor. Now, I, I adored cutting that scene with the next door neighbor because she was slightly dotty anyway. But when I cut her, I put many more pauses on her than she actually should have. So that when he asks her a question, she just looks. <laughs> what? what? I, I'd never done that before, but basically, you know, you just sort of, you, you use the bit of her that Oscar is talking over anyway, and you just take the sound out. So, you know, there it is, so she's listening to him, but it's actually, it's as if you use it as the reply too. So you've got all this sort of stuff on the front before she does anything like answering. So she looks completely mad, because if you'd cut that quickly, it wouldn't mean anything somehow. It's just the pacing that she did. It was really bizarre. And I, I've used this in subsequent pictures you know, to make people look very strange. You know, that they don't reply immediately to anybody. They're just sort of in a world of their own. I talked to you about this. I talked to you about it in the office the other day, didn't I? Didn't I? Look, why can't you do what you're told? Why can't you do what you're told? Hey, why can't you? Look, look at you. Look. Did I tell you to? Haven't you got a head? DVD producer Laurent Bouzereau. I personally met Truffaut in 1980. I was living in Paris, and I would visit a film store called Limelight every Saturdays, looking for new and old posters. Films come out on Wednesdays in France, and Truffaut's latest at the time, The Last Metro, was to be released that Wednesday. I always anxiously waited for his films, and I was talking to the owner of the film shop on that Saturday morning about Truffaut and The Last Metro. As I was pronouncing his name, he walked into the store. Needless to say, both the owner of the shop and myself looked at each other in shock and felt like we had just pronounced some magic words and the genie had appeared. Truffaut was very different in person from the persona he seemed to exude on screen. He appeared very reserved and conservative. It was the weekend and he was wearing a blue suit and tie and little glasses. He browsed around the store and came to the cash register to pay. Uh, he had gotten, I remember, an old book by his friend and mentor, film critic André Bazin. I couldn't resist, and I started a conversation with him, and we spoke of Hitchcock and Steven Spielberg. The one thing that surprised me was when I mentioned how excited I was about his new film, The Last Metro, he said he was scared. His few previous films had flopped, and it was interesting to see how humble and how human Truffaut was. I remember we ended our conversation, and that was it. The irony is that The Last Metro became Truffaut's biggest success. It won many César awards, the French equivalent to the Oscars, and put him back where he belonged, at the top. Tom Noble. I was working as a first assistant on Stanley Donnan's Arabesque. And um, I was in the cutting room one day, and I got this call from um, this guy called Mickey Delamar, who was uh, the producer of a film I worked on called The Amorous Adventures of Moel Flanders, which was Kim Novak and Richard Johnson. 
Terence Young directed it, who's an amazing guy. So I'm working on Arabesque. The phone rings, Mickey Delamar says to me, oh, I'm in the south of France, Tom, uh, with a French director. So I said, oh, well, who? And he said, oh, you've probably never heard of him. His name is Francois Truffaut. And I said, you have Truffaut in the south of France? He said, yes, 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 we're making this science fiction film about firemen. I said, it's not Fahrenheit 451, as he said. Yes, yes, have you heard of it? I said, of course, you know, it's a Ray Bradbury, it's great. So he said, anyway, be that as it may, he said, Francois is looking for uh, a woman editor that speaks fluent French. Do you know one? I thought, I was thinking, you know, off the top of my head, well, I know, you know, there's Anne Coates and all these people, but I don't know if she speaks French. And I said, well, leave it with me and I'll actually try and find somebody. And then I, the more I thought about it, the more I thought, well, you know, I'm not going to actually recommend somebody else. This is Francois Truffaut. This is my big chance. So I called Mickey Delamar back and I said to him, I speak fluent French and I'd love to do it. He said, well, he said, keep on looking for these women. I said, OK, fine. I heard nothing. Like a month went by, six weeks went by. Phone rings again in the cutting room. He said, oh, by the way, he said, I'm in the art department with uh, Truffaut and I've told him about you and he'd like to meet you. And he said, remember this, he doesn't speak a word of English. I said, fine. So I go and I think, oh God, I know exactly what I'm going to say. You know, I'm going to tell him how much I love Jules Légier and Quatre Cent Coups and Thierry sur le Pianiste and all the, It's going to be great. So I go in there and he's very, very shy. This little man, he's smoking the Gaulois and biting his nails. And like, he's like worse than I am because I mean, I'm nervous, but he's more nervous than I am, it seems. And he starts to speak to me and I understand everything he says. But I cannot, I can say, you know, entendu, d'accord. <laughs> but I can't formulate the sentence that says, oh, I love your movies, I'd, I'd love to work with you. And obviously this interview is like grinds to this horrible halt. I think, oh, God. So I think, well, the only thing I can do is gracefully retire at this point. I think, thank you very much. I go out the door. And as I close the door, it all comes exactly what I was going to say. And I thought, it's too late. You cannot go through that door again. You have blown the opportunity of a lifetime. How could you be so stupid? Right. So now I go back to being the first assistant and I hear you no know, Truffaut is interviewing every editor in town, you know, male, female, it doesn't matter. He's just interviewing everybody. I think, oh God, this is so pathetic. And this is something like November, December comes and I'm in the country with my family on New Year's Eve. Very late at night, the phone rings, and it's Mickey Delamar. And he said, Happy New Year. And I said, Well, Happy New Year to you, Mickey. He says, um, I just want to call because you got the picture. I said, What? He said, Got the picture. He said, Sharpen up your French a bit before you arrive. But <laughs> okay. So I thought, this is so exciting. So anyway, so now, instead of like sharpening up my French, I mean, my French consisted basically of the films of Cocteau and Leo Ferre. That was my French, basically. So if those words occurred in those. <laughs> Two people. I was fine. <laughs> but then I sort of, I, I played nothing but French music, I read French books, so I got to be with Truffaut. So we're sitting watching some Hitchcock movie late at night, and <clears throat> we come to the end of it, and he said, and I say to him, Look, I have to ask you, Francois, why did you pick me? And he said, Well, I interviewed all these editors, and they all told me how much they love Casper Sancourt. <laughs> But he said, you, you were so shy and you were so nice that I thought I had to go with you. <laughs> so that's how I did it. It was really, it was amazing. <laughs> must be here somewhere. What must be here? Something, something I have to find. Find and destroy. Let me look. You wouldn't know where to start looking. It was my job. How big? About this big. Papers. Oh. It's no use. We'll find it, don't you worry. It's a list of addresses. Friends of my uncle. Who they are and where they're hiding. We'll find it. Mm -hmm. 
DVD producer Laurent Bouzereau. The shooting of Fahrenheit 451 was supposed to begin on Monday, January 10th, 1966, but was delayed. Doctor's orders. Julie Christie was too tired after nine months of shooting on Dr. Zhivago. Truffaut admitted that getting the project done was extremely difficult. He was turned down at the beginning both by French film companies and American studios. At one point, he got very close with the French branch of United Artists, Les Artistes Associés, but they chose that man from Rio over Fahrenheit 451. Truffaut claimed that he was able to make the film thanks to his cast, Oscar Werner and Julie Christie. Both were at the time huge stars, and uh, that allowed him to get the movie made. Fahrenheit 451 was the first project to be produced by MCA's London branch, dedicated to the production of independent films. The second film to be done there under that umbrella was Charlie Chaplin's film of The Countess from Hong Kong, which began shooting roughly two weeks after Fahrenheit. At the beginning of production, Truffaut received a visit from his friend, director Jean-Luc Godard, who had done, of course, Breathless. Since he had not started shooting yet, he took Godard around the sets. But when Godard left, Universal gave Truffaut the go-ahead to start shooting, even without Julie Christie. Truffaut at that point started getting very nervous, and he even turned to Geraldine Chaplin, Chaplin's daughter, and asked her if her father was ever anxious when he started a movie. And the reply was, yes, he is terrified. That alone must have been reassuring. They are books, each one, men and women, everyone. Shooting officially began on Thursday, January 14th. The first things to be shot were the programs that Linda, Montag's wife, watches obsessively on television. That was followed by the mock news report showing two firemen shaving the head of a young man. This particular scene was based on a real occurrence that Truffaut read took place in Russia. While developing the film, Truffaut had initially thought of many gadgets and futuristic visions. But with the success of films such as Dr. No and From Russia with Love, the James Bond movies, he decided to go the opposite way, and he planned to do with Fahrenheit 451, as he said, a James Bond, but in the Middle Ages. Now we have to go. Separately. You to your book people and me to <laughs> strip this off. We shall see each other again. No, we shan't. Why pretend we shall? You are right, we shan't. One struggle for François Truffaut on the film took place at the beginning of shooting, and it had to do with the format in which the film was to be shot. The studio wanted him to shoot the film 133, which basically would fit a television screen. Truffaut put up a fight and won the right to shoot the movie in 185, which explains why you have black bars at the bottom and top of your screen when you watch the movie on this DVD. Did well again, good, excellent. Come on, Harry, no Truffaut was not completely happy with the set design of Montag's house. He had hoped for a more contrasty uh, feeling between the old and modern society. Uh, he made a few changes at the last minute and admitted that while shooting a film, one should learn not to trust anyone. Truffaut said that if he had a chance to redo the film, he would instruct his set and costume designers to approach the film with children's eyes. Let's make the fire truck look like a toy. The firemen should be dressed like toy soldiers, etc. Truffaut wanted the film to be simple despite the enormous subject of the story. Truffaut's ideas were indeed simple, but always meaningful. Remember the young man reading a book at the beginning of the film and getting a phone call telling him to get out. Notice that he is eating an apple Right away, Truffaut establishes reading with a sin, the original sin. When the firemen arrive and burn the books, we understand the premise that reading is by the standards of that society a sin.
Columbia University professor Annette Insdorf. Well, now that I look upon Fahrenheit 451 in the context of a later film like The Wild Child, for example, I feel that these are deeply connected motion pictures about characters coming of age. Yes, of course, Montag is much older than Victor in The Wild Child, or for that matter, Antoine Duanel in The 400 Blows. Nevertheless, these are kindred spirits, each of whom is able to sort of transcend his circumstances by the written word, by learning how to read and how to use language. I think we can leave it to him. To know how to find, one must first know how to hide. Isn't that so? I like a man who knows his work. Right, you men, just check the rest of the house. Everything ready, Fabian? Come on, hurry it up. DVD producer Laurent Bouzereau. Practically all the dialogue from the film had to be dubbed, and Truffaut liked that. He felt that it was a chance to get almost a second performance, another chance to making it perfect. What are you doing in there? You got mad. Ah, come on, get back in there. Just the books, the books. One brilliant idea was, of course, the opening credits. And it's all those zooms on television antennas, which incidentally were installed and filmed on the roof of Pinewood Studios. They were filmed on the last day of principal photography, on Thursday, April 28th. This gibberish is enough to drive a man mad. Thought you could learn from these how to walk in the waters, did you? Montag must learn to think a little. Consider how all these writings, all these recipes for happiness, disagree. Now let this heap of contradictions burn itself out. You know, it's we who at this moment are working for man's happiness. Look, isn't that lovely? The pages, like, like flower petals or butterflies, luminous and black. Who can explain the fascination of fire? What draws us to it, whether we're young or old? Stephen C. Smith, Bernard Herrmann, biographer. Over and over, Bernard Herrmann was able to write music that worked on two levels. He, he's clearly writing to the images that we're seeing, but he's also writing to the emotions that are being felt. And I think the sequence in which the books are being burned is an extraordinary example of that. The fact that he writes music that so perfectly captures the maelstrom of, of, of this horrible conflagration that's going on, but he's also giving us the, the churning, almost uh, sickening distress that we're feeling watching this. And yet by writing for harps and these strings, there's a beauty about it as well. It, it's an amazingly complex feeling that he gives us. I think that's why we listen to his scores and, and go back to them again and again. Truffaut loved the score for Fahrenheit 451, and he attended the recording session, which went well, but there were a few problems, mainly because Bernard Herrmann didn't speak French, and Truffaut really didn't speak English. And at one point, Truffaut wanted a change in the instrumentation and uh, was trying to tell Herrmann, and Herrmann turned to one of his, his friends, another composer named Laurie Johnson, and, and said, what's he saying? And Laurie Johnson didn't speak French, and it was a, a room full of people looking at each other, waiting for someone to step in and explain. But they did speak the most important language, which was uh, that of artist to artist, and uh, certainly music is an international language, and the recording session, and the collaboration between the two was a very happy one. Producer Lewis M. Allen for that particular scene when he burned his own house and then burned uh, the, police, the captain, uh, when you had a double that you saw was in flames and fell down, and that double was actually burned some. He was, it was, uh, wasn't serious, but he was, uh, he actually got some burns in that. And those, those were, uh, I always felt extremely nervous about those scenes. It just seemed to me there was all kinds of possibilities of uh, disaster. We did a lot of shots of those, that book burning. I don't recall how long he kept that up, but it was kept repeating. He went doing more and more. So they, were, they were inserted and so on. The choices he made were, uh, I think overall, he got 
a great many of the books that he would like to have in there. Some of them didn't burn properly and didn't, therefore were not in the film. Some of them did. But I think I, my feeling was that all everything we saw was in some way uh, significant to him in one way or another. Genet, for example, was in there, and you noticed, and of course, the Dali and uh, Caillou de Cinema, which I thought was interesting. Running through the streets, repeating, calling all citizens to join together against DVD producer Laurent Bouzereau. The film was selected for the Venice Film Festival, but reviewers were not kind to the film or to Truffaut, both in Europe and in America. Truffaut apparently even sent a letter to Ray Bradbury apologizing for the film, which he felt was an exciting adventure which had crumbled under the scope of the project. Actress Julie Christie. This is the, this is the hunter hunted, and it's a man of intelligence who simply couldn't get over his, uh, he couldn't crush his own in genetic intelligence. This is real science fiction. This is science fiction like modern science fiction. <laughs> but it's completely what happens. I mean, okay, so they don't fly like this, but uh, you know, the, the helicopters are the same thing, aren't they? With those big flashlights, uh, covering the country and picking out people who are on the run, when people are on the run. I wasn't thinking prisoners, particularly escaped prisoners, but, um, you know, or immigrants crossing lines. Exactly the same story. I think Oscar's a terrific actor, was a terrific actor. I'm just sorry he's not alive. Um, anymore, because he's such a good actor, such a talent. Yeah, look, I think he's just fascinating in this film. He's absolutely, his intelli actor's intelligence has completely grasped the part. I think the music is, is uh, extraordinary. It's so unexpected. And it's emotional, just here. It's like a, the book that made the woman cry. Woods, the beauty, the kindness, the longevity of woods. End of the road for him. Beginning of another one. Editor Tom Noble. It was really wonderful to be a part of that. You know, I felt like, God, this is my first film. And all the rest of the time, I've just been marking time. You know, this is like the beginning of something quite extraordinary. You know, it's like something that you really love doing, that you actually have a facility for, that it's easy. This is easy, and yet it's so incredibly rewarding and exciting. And I thought, God, this is, this is incredible. But I, I, I mean, subsequently, I mean, I think, well, this is, was an amazing accident. But, you know, now I think, well, there's no such thing as an accident. You know, things happen for a very good reason. And this, this incredible meeting that we had was, like, magical. It actually propelled me into somewhere where I would never have gone, you know. I would have just sort of, I don't know what I would have done, actually. I mean, I, I'd been in book publishing before I was, you know, an assistant editor. I, God knows what I was going to do after that. But this just kept me on that, you know, I thought, this is amazingly exciting stuff. I love it. Ah, there it is. The aerial patrol has sighted the wanted man. Actress Julie Christie. Well, this is like uh, Western television during a war. Provide them with that climax. Sort of con images constructed to um, present a, a, a story, whether it's, whether it's the truth or not. Factoids. But of course, this has happened in the, in the media, doesn't it? It's not only on television, it's always happened, doesn't it? It's like um, when people are arrested, the wrong people are arrested for a crime that has to have a, um, that has to have a culprit. 
I mean, in our societies, it, uh, I was going to say, the, the, for instance, during the war against the, um, between the IRA and the British, um, there was one bombing, and I think six people were, um, were uh, arrested, all wrongly, and they stayed in prison for 15 years. And all that time, we were assured of their, um, of their guilt. But we didn't kill them. We didn't pretend they were dead. <laughs> the lie was, uh, was there, but it wasn't. You're dead. Quite so extreme at that point. Yeah, you may as well shed your old skin. Producer Lewis M. Allen. You know, the book people, um, it was an opportunity really there to, uh, to have some really sprightly dialogue. They were book people, and therefore they were not... Uh, uh, I think that was overlooked a bit by having them each just recite. That it could have been a little wittier, but they tried to throw a bit of wit in there, like as Pride and Prejudice, and saying one is pride and one is prejudice in two volumes. Uh, I don't think anybody knew whether it was ever in two volumes or not. Now here's Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. And here's the Corsair by Byron. She used to be married to a chief of police. Now that skinny fellow is Alice in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll. Where's Alice through the looking glass today? She should be somewhere about. Ah, now there's The Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. He ate his book so they couldn't burn it. Waiting for Godot by Samuel Beckett. Oh, you see the little blonde coming towards us. Watch her blush. I'm Jean-Paul Sartre's The Jewish Question. Delighted to meet you. I'm The Martian Chronicles by Ray Bradbury. Author Ray Bradbury. At the first screening of Fahrenheit 451 in the studio, I didn't realize they were preparing a surprise for me because in the film, a young character comes up and says, I'm the Martian Chronicles by Ray Bradbury. Well, I went into shock. I couldn't believe it. There it was on the screen, and there was all the people in the studio, including Alan Ladd, staring at me to see how I'd react. And of course, I went right through the ceiling. It was wonderful. I am Jane Austen's pride of You cannot set out to do anything. You do something and hope that it engages people. You can't think of ways to engage people. That's intellectual. That's, that's all wrong. But you write from the heart. You write with passion for unknown reasons. And the book is done, huh? All of my books have been written that way. I don't know what I'm doing. And six months later, a year later, I wake up and the book is done. And it's all, but it's human, see? And you don't look for hooks or ways to do things to people. That's what's wrong with these other films. They think that they've got to blast you every five minutes with another 10-ton truck of gasoline, huh? And then people tumble over and out of the scene, and then they have another explosion. They can scare you, except they don't. So Truffaut knew that and passionately, quietly did it. It was not an intellectual exercise. Yeah, well, only 50 or so, but there are many, many more scattered around in the band of Editor the Tom Noble. Before I, I did the movie, I, I, I loved Ray Bradbury's short stories. I mean, I'd read all of those, you know, The Martian Chronicles and Golden Apples of the Sun and all those books. So, you know, when the, when the prospect came up of doing Fahrenheit, it was like a double whammy. It was like, not only would I be working with Truffaut, but with a Ray Bradbury story, who I thought was an absolutely incredible writer. So I think that, I mean, it's a good story. Actually, uh, and when it was written, it was even a better story than this. And it's like somehow today, if you think about books, it's kind of irrelevant, you know, with the with the internet and you know e-books and all this sort of thing. Um, that's why I'm amazed that people are thinking of you know remaking it. It doesn't seem to make sense unless they you know do use different aspects of the book and don't concentrate so much on the on the on the book burning and everything like that. Make me that kind of an incidental thing, but. Um, and it, it, it's of its time, you know, it's one of those things, it's like it's a little capsule that when you see it again, it's a, it's, it's a period piece, you know, it really is, and it works as a period piece, you actually you know, respond to it as a period piece. You sort of, you're outside it, and you watch it happening in this sort of weird time thing, and it, and it works on that level, it absolutely works still. It was crushing for me because, you know, first of all, you know, you do a film and it's your first film, and the film really didn't come out for a while. 
So I was in that sort of limbo land. Like, I wasn't an editor, really, because I'd done one film, but nobody'd seen it. I couldn't go back to being an assistant. But Francois had said to me, I'm doing The Bride War Black next, which he was going to shoot in English. You know, with Jean Moreau still, because she could speak English. It was fine. And I'd love you to do it. And I thought, well, this is really great. So I don't have to worry, because I've got my next picture all lined up. And so whatever happens, I, I'm just going to sit tight. And I can't go back to being an assistant. I'll wait for that film. And then when the reviews came out, they really slanged um, the film because they said, you know, Francois should never have made an English language film. He has no ear for the dialogue and so on and so on and so on. And I think he was really crushed and basically he thought to himself, well, that's it. I'm not going to do this again. I'm going to go back and do uh, La Marie est en noir rather than The Bright War Black. And so, you know, I was out of the loop and that was it. So that was my last time that I was able to work with Truffaut, which was kind of sad because it was like it was such a great relationship that we had, you know. Actress Julie Christie. Oh, this is, this is um, oral history. This is wonderful. I mean, this is how, it, prior to books. But this, this is what, the, uh, like all stories were once, they were all remembered in pre, um, pre, before print, weren't they? What you've also got here is, is um, um, a society which has re, um, rekindled its, its powers of memory. People used to remember, I mean, as I say, people used to remember stories. They used to remember all sorts of things. But now, because everything's done on uh, uh, little machines, we don't have this fabulous power of memorizing and memory, which these people have retaught themselves. Passing on knowledge to your children, something else that doesn't happen anymore. This is a, um, almost like a pre-technological society, isn't it? Ah, oh, isn't that beautiful? Well, the first snows of winter fell and we got snow. Anybody else, anybody else, because of the continuity, would have waited for the next day. And uh, anybody else, you'd have stopped shooting, but not Francois. Yes, I remember uh, one, it was April. It was my birthday, and suddenly there was snow. I was born April the 14th, so this must have been April the 14th. God knows what year it was. This is very lovely, two people. It's wonderful because it's not at all sexual, and yet it's two people who were completely bonded at that point. You feel this is a wonderful, strong relationship that will last, really last. Great strength there. I mean, it's not overtly sexual. I mean, it's not about sex. It's about bonding and understanding and sharing. An understanding of what life is composed of and made of. That's a wonderful thing. Fancy that, the only written words in this movie that is the end. If you think about it, if you see the film again, there's no, there's no writing in it.